You're listening to the Bahai World News Service. Now live at local house of worship at the meeting called by Bahai World. In this episode, we are joined by representatives from the global offices of the Bahai International Community. The discussion explores the conception and evolution of the BIC over the years, to its present work and contributions to discourses about the future and well-being of humanity. We hear from Solomon Bellet from the Addis Ababa office. The, the ultimate objective of the establishment of Africa Union itself is to create a, a united, prosperous, and peaceful Africa, to which we are also trying to contribute. Rochelle Bayani from the Brussels office. One of the big questions that I think all of our office are asking themselves is what does it mean for humanity to organize itself mm -hmm. at the global level? Hatem El Hadi from the Cairo office. And because we're really realizing that without the advancement of the status of women worldwide, humanity can never progress. Samin Fahandesh from the Geneva office. This conception of peace that's elaborated in the peace message is beyond just a lack of conflict or a lack of violence. It goes actually into really building peaceful societies around the world. And Bonnie Dugal from the New York office. The Baha'i international community was amongst the first non-governmental organizations and faith-based organizations that was established at the UN. The BIC also has an office in Jakarta but Destia Nauris, the representative for that office, was unable to join us for this conversation. From the Baha'i World News Service, this is In Conversation, a podcast series that explores experiences from Baha'i efforts to contribute to social progress from the grassroots to the international level. So welcome, friends. It's wonderful to be here as... Uh representative of the Baha'i International Community in Cairo, being the youngest of the network of Baha'i International Community offices. It's my pleasure to start off this conversation. Wani, you've been with the Baha'i International Community for some time now. Maybe you can start us off by telling us what the Baha'i International Community does and a little bit about its history. So the Baha'i International Community offices are representative of the worldwide Baha'i community. And the New York office is the representative office to the United Nations, as is the office in Geneva. And we engage at the level of discourse at the UN, at the international level, and we engage in discourses on global governance, on the equality of women and men, the role of religion, on youth, gender equality, social cohesion, social, cohesion, social development, sustainable development, and many others. Yes. And these conversations go on around the year, and we are also present in many spaces internationally. When we talk about the work of the BIC, it's really to widen the engagement of the Baha'i community with many different actors at the you know, international level, regional level. But I think what's really interesting about the work of the BIC is that this aspect of the work of the Baha'i community has actually existed since the establishment of the faith. Since the time of Baha'u'llah, Abdul Baha, the guardian himself, have always made efforts to engage with dignitaries, with you know, government officials, with civil society organizations. And it's so interesting to now be sitting here around the table in so many different regions of the world contributing at the UN and in Brussels, at Addis Ababa, Cairo, New York, Geneva, and really, be continuing this legacy, this work uh, that has started. Yeah, so it, it was in 1925 at the League of Nations that the guardian of the faith, Shoghi Effendi, established a Baha'i Bureau. And that bureau in Geneva really functioned till 1957 and tried to engage in ways by which some real solutions could be offered to humanity living in peace. And of course, that followed, was followed by the Second World War. 
And in 1946, when the United Nations was established, there were Baha'i representatives in San Francisco for the signing of the charter. And then eventually there was a Baha'i International Community Office at the United Nations that was established in 1948. We were registered with the United Nations Department of Public Information and later got consultative status with the Economic and Social Council of the UN. So I think the Baha'i international community was amongst the first non-governmental organizations and faith-based organizations that was established at the UN. Mm -hmm. And Mildred Motorheader was the first representative and she engaged in many international fora. But then Later on, we had uh, some significant conferences, like there was the first conference on women in Mexico City, the second in Copenhagen, followed by Nairobi, and then the Fourth World Conference uh, uh, for Women in Beijing. And there were many hundred Baha'is, I think around 600 Baha'is that were mm -hmm. present at that time. I believe, Hatem, your mom was there. She was well. there, 1995, yes. I remember. As was I in 95. <laughs> yes. and, and so we've had... Uh, the BIC's UN office engage in all the major conferences, particularly those in the 1990s, starting with Rio, and then there was the Human Rights Conference in Vienna, there was the Beijing Conference, there was the conference in Copenhagen on social development, the Habitat Conference in Nairobi. And so we have engaged in these all with the intent of contributing to the discourses with the idea that we want to stimulate that movement towards eventually achieving peace. And at the level of the European Union, uh, Rachel, you, you are, you're engaging in this and your, your office was established a little more recently, but you've done a lot with the MEPs as well as uh, members of the commission. Yes, so the Baha'i International Community Brussels office engages with institutions at the European level. So it engages with the European Union, but also with the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, as well as with the Council of Europe. And at the European Union, where we're based, we're very closely engaging with members of the European Parliament, with the European Commission, with the Council of the European Union, really to try and learn alongside them how this concept of the oneness of humanity can find expression. And sometimes we think this is a very simple idea mm -hmm. or an abstract idea, but then to really understand how that one idea can find expression in a diversity of policy areas. What does it mean for, for instance, a policy area around agricultural sustainability? Mm -hmm. What does it mean for the relation between continents? So for us, this is a joint learning process with all the actors that are at the European Union, including civil society actors, but also faith-based organizations. Solomon, you engage with a lot of faith-based organizations in Addis Ababa. Yeah, as, as part of our, our mandate to, to participate in the discourse of society, or particularly on issues that affect the African society. Initially, we, we, it was established in 2014, so while kind of uh, scanning the environment, you know, reading reality, we realized that, of course, Africa is affected by uh, you know, violence, you know, but mm -hmm. the, the violence could be because of different reasons. And one a major one is religious conflict and also tribal conflict. So naturally, we decided to, to be involved in the peace and security area. So we have a lot of participation with actors with like-minded organizations that have a seat in Africa, in Addis Ababa par particularly. Then, of course, naturally, in our participation with that space, we realized that because of Baha'u'llah has given us so much teachings on the essential harmony that has to exist between religions, or the oneness of religion, like as Brazil's focused on the oneness of humanity, our focus became the oneness of religion. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. So now basically we are we are acti we actively participate in different spaces with like network like face to action, African Council of Religious Leaders, or Religion for Peace. So we we come together, you know, we we meet regularly. In fact, uh, fortunately, the African Union has established an interface dialogue forum, and we have become a, a member of the General Assembly, which also provides an opportunity to to learn from others. You know uh, how they they're doing, how they are trying to create harmony mm -hmm. between among the society. That's pretty much that we were involved in the interface dialogue forum. Yeah, you talked about religious strife. And I think whether peace is going to be realized after all these unimaginable horrors that we see, basically because humanity is clinging to old patterns of behavior, or whether we achieve it by consultative will is really left up to us. And I think <clears throat> a lot of places in the world we are seeing human rights violations, and Geneva is a hub for with the Human Rights Council situated there and the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Our office in Geneva has been there since the 1980s and really engaging mm. in the discourses of at the Human Rights Council and others. Simin, you've been quite active lately in food, food security issues, right? Yes, <clears throat> our office in Geneva, as, as you mentioned, has been there for, for many decades. I look back at how far really the office has come and where it started, why it started. And one of the elements actually of the work of each of our offices is that we really read the reality of our regions and work with the institutions that are based there. And in the case of Geneva, as uh, Bonnie mentioned, because of the BIC's proximity to human rights institutions such as the Human Rights Council and OHCHR. It's uh, the office that has been looking primarily at human rights. Uh, and of course, unfortunately, since 1979, the Baha'is in Iran have been systematically persecuted, of course, in the early 80s with over 200 executions and then ongoing persecutions against them now in terms of educational restrictions, economic restrictions, confiscation of properties, burial issues and many other issues that I think we all know about. And so the office focuses on really advocate, advocating on their behalf. Of course, the identity and really the purpose of the existence of the Baha'i international community is to contribute to discourses of society, is to be essentially applying Baha'i principles to present day challenges facing humanity. But because we are working at international institutions, and Baha'is in Iran, of course, have essentially tried to resolve their challenges in every way possible at the national level. And since that has not worked, we have been using the spaces at the international level to advocate on their behalf. So in a way, the Baha'i community uh, is offering to the world experiences of how to apply these lofty principles Mm -hmm. into the practical uh, setting, right, in the fields. So we have Baha'is in thousands of communities around the world, and all the member states of the United Nations pretty much have Baha'i communities in them. And the Baha'is, they're working alongside their society to engage in advancing society one step at a time, exploring at the level of thought how can we have a peaceful society? How can we have cohesion within society? How can we have equality between men and women? How can we have, you know, uh, more harmony between various religions that exist? And all these insights are really being extracted and uh, gathered and then accordingly shared in these international forums. And I think this is a very interesting area to explore how Baha'i is actually bringing some of these insights that are being gathered from everywhere and learning how these lofty ideas can be actually implemented. Mm -hmm. And I know in Addis, you particularly explore the area of conflict resolution and cohesive societies. Yeah, because also partly, as I, I said earlier, there are, there are conflicts. Africa is basically, we can say, it's a conflict-ridden continent and the uh, import of small arms increasing despite the 
the effort that's going on in African Union. And it's not, not necessarily the African society is violent or, you know, would like to fight. But, you know, there is still also not only colonial legacies, there are still powers at play, you know, who would like to, I mean, arm through the, the conflicts that are happening, you know, arm sales, raw materials, exploitation, all this is happening. So all these factors play together. Also, there is a high uh, unemployment rate of the youth. So, so, you know, Africa is the youngest, we say, the youngest population. About 70% of the population is used. Mm. So unless you really train them well and, you know, uh, get them employment or engage them, uh, probably uh, a number of things can cause conflict. So these are the things that we would like to understand, the causes and effects, and also how the Baha'i principles and the community experiences can, can share, shed light onto these problems. So together... We always try to maintain a space where these issues are discussed mm -hmm. and, and shared. And not only shared, actually, our ultimate goal is, as, as you suggested, to influence, kind of share, at least contribute to the process of silencing the guns in Africa, mm -hmm. which also the Africa Union is, is trying to do. The, the ultimate objective of the establishment of Africa Union itself is to create a, a united, prosperous, and peaceful Africa, mm -hmm. to which we are also trying to contribute. Yeah, Baha'i Baha communities around the world are engaging youth in some really important conversations about their future. And in fact, you have young children, Rochelle. Yes, I, I have one 13-year-old <laughs> and a smaller boy. But um, just to say that really we have so many parents that are very, very deeply worried mm -hmm about their children, especially as they enter that very, very crucial phase of their lives where they are no longer children, they're not quite adults yet either. And it's a moment in their lives where they're about to take very crucial decisions as to what direction really they want their life to look like. And we sometimes think these are decisions that are taken later in life. But the foundations yeah. for the ability to take these decisions is really cast at that point. Mm. And the, the Baha'i communities around the world, together with their collaborators, have developed a beautiful program. It's essentially a program of capacity building where children and youth from an early age on, are taught this capacity to see themselves as protagonists and to see that they too have agency and that they too have a role to play in the shaping of our future civilizations. Because if we look around the way our society operates, it's really sort of breathing passivity into children from an early age. Mm -hmm. They're being entertained, they're uh, being encouraged to consume. And so how do you break away from these patterns and allow this youth to understand that the primary purpose in life is really to serve others and to contribute to the betterment of society. And this material is so beautifully done because it really speaks to your ability to have a spiritual perception, but at the same time, it allows you to develop your intellectual capacities. And so, for instance, in one of the stories, it's about how each one of us has the ability of choice, how we all have a free will but that we also need to sort of tap into that strength to mm -hmm. make that choice. And this allows the youth to discuss amongst themselves what kind of forces they see that surround them, sort of negative forces and positive forces. How can they distinguish them? You need to train your spiritual faculties of understanding which forces allow me to progress mm -hmm. and which ones do not. 
If you're trained to detect injustice in its most subtle form, you're able to act against it. And you're able to realize that you're not just responsible to sort of act justly yourself, but you also actually, in the spirit of service to humanity, you're responsible to ensure that justice is established wherever you are and to act in a manner that allows for that to happen. So to, to put this in the context of the BIS work, for example, now mm -hmm. we have this knowledge generated in the activities. Mm -hmm. Now the BIC had these workers with the African Com Committee of Experts on the Rights and Welfare of the Child, mm -hmm. which is one of the strongest agencies within the African Union. So they have always this biannual meeting where the experts go to the countries, study the situation of children, and also governments also report. Then there's always this conversation, ultimately, what are the root causes of this human rights violation? You know, why are not the children being sent to school? And what kind of lessons should children learn? So the Baha'i International Community is always there, you know, working with them, you know, sharing these insights. You know. mm -hmm. Because already it's, there is material that we have been offering. There are classrooms, including with the youth program. There are community schools around Africa where we're really learning uh, learning a lot about how schools can be run in a, in a systematic and efficient way without really investing so much money. Mm -hmm. So this, this knowledge is being generated and then documented, and then the BIC now has the opportunity to take that, to share it to that level. I think, you know, what I find actually fascinating about what you're saying and what uh, other colleagues are sharing and about the work of the Baha'i national community is that essentially what we are doing is we are constantly trying to build our capacity to draw on the insights on the one hand uh, the grassroots level mm. the Baha'i communities around the world are building through their efforts in their neighborhoods with uh, children's classes, youth groups, devotional gatherings, study circles and then also draw on the insights of the Baha'i community for example in areas and countries and regions where there is social action and and then also from the efforts of individual Baha'is around the world to, you know, in their work, how are they contributing at the level of thought in their work? Because it is also, I mean, every individual Baha'i is, is working in a certain field, whether they're working for the UN or for a corporation or as a teacher or as a nurse or wherever they are, every single individual is constantly learning this ability to be thinking and applying the Baha'i principles to their work. And I think as the Baha'i international community, we are constantly trying to learn from everyone mm -hmm. and really then represent the overall learning of the Baha'i community in all of these different areas and then represent that to international institutions. And I think that is such a fascinating one. And then at the same time, we have to be deeply engaged in, our, in the institutions that are in our regions, understand their functioning, understand the issues we are working on. Nobani was saying, for example, that in recent years, our office has been looking at other discourses such as food security, for example. We've been looking at public health because of the World Health Organization being in Geneva, the discourse on migration, you know, movement of populations, and a few other er role of media and society. And, and it's been very interesting because one aspect of the work is really understanding the field you're in. So we have to understand what are the discussions, for example, in, in the food security discourse? What are the main issues? What are the main debates at the UN? And then what are Baha'is doing at the grassroots? What do the Baha'i teachings say about agriculture and food security? And then somehow be making a link between all of these different areas and different experiences, teachings, and then representing that to the international level. So I think it's a, it's a complex, but extremely interesting work. Yeah, we've been engaging in a discourse on youth and also engaging in the space 
the youth space that the UN has created. Mm. And we've been able to share some of these experiences working with youth at the grassroots level. Uh, because a lot of the youth that come to the UN, uh, one of the main asks that they have is that they have a seat at the table. And that's important. But I think it's even more important to really understand what role uh, youth can play in bettering the world. Mm -hmm. And once you have that seat at the table, or even if you don't, and, and you're working at the grassroots level, no contribution is too small, mm -hmm. that everybody has value and can contribute to that. And similarly, you know, we, we engage in other commissions at the UN. Uh, these are meetings, governmental meetings, but civil society also engages, and the Commission on the Status of Women being one. And Hatim, you've attended at least one in the past. Absolutely. And how did you find that, your engagement? Yeah, so, so as you said, we as Baha'is participate in spaces and discourses that we believe are can contribute to the well-being of society. And so CSW, or Commission on Status of Women, that's held annually by the United Nations, is one such event where essentially the whole world, government, intergovernment agencies and non-governmental agencies participate in this discussion about how can the status of women be advanced globally. And because we're really realizing that without the advancement of the status of women worldwide, humanity can never progress. And I think one of the pleasures of working with BIC or participating in these spaces is really going to CSW, where we discussed last year was about innovation and gender equality. Mm -hmm. So this whole area of, you know, or how sometimes the way that we approach technology, the way technology is being utilized, can sometimes be segregating or oppressing to some, ex to some extent uh, women in certain areas. And so the exploration of such topics and realizing how, you know, collectively at the level of thought humanity can advance in order to give more space for innovation, for women for innovation. I think that's something that we were trying to pursue in our conversations last year. And also last year, we were very happy that we managed to host an Arabic language event in New York office, where we invited Arab delegates and also some of the missions of Arab countries in New York to participate. And that was very enriching discussion that we have been following up throughout this last year on and it's been quite quite enriching and you know so, well, we are often asked do you see you know all the work that you do and do you see any advancement mm. and in fact it was Gianni Bellerio mm. our representative from the Geneva office who really worked uh, in the discourse on the advancement of women and gender equality and and I see more and more men, such as yourself, mm -hmm. coming to the Commission on the Status of Women because Baha'is really believe that advancement of women is not just about women. Equality of women and men is about the betterment of men as well because mm -hmm. only as women advance will humanity advance and men also be able to achieve the greatness which might be theirs. So, you know, it's, it's something that is a responsibility of men as well. And Jani's work in the 1980s and 90s has begun to bear fruit now because the UN has started recognizing the role of men and boys for the advancement of women. And I always think Jani is probably looking down and smiling because he passed away, uh, you know, too young. But this was really an area that he used to contribute to and we've seen some positive results from that engagement and you know uh, as Baha'is we work alongside others with others for the betterment of all people mm -hmm. not only Baha'i communities and your recent experience in defending the rights of the Baha'is in Iran have also brought you into the discourse about the advancement of women and the equality of women and men. And there's this campaign that we've had about our story as one. And you're going to also go to New York this March to the Commission on the Status of Women. Mm -hmm. And we're going to jointly host a, a program on that. Uh, 
Yes, uh, a lot of people know about the Our Stories One campaign, which essentially, I mean, it was created in honor of the 10 Baha'i women who were executed, but really the Baha'i international community used the opportunity to be honoring not just these 10 women, but all women in Iran, and in a way, all women around the world. I mean, mm -hmm. what we saw with the campaign was that it was really adopted by all women around the world and really brought about this concept of, for example, um, gender equality and diversity. You know, what, what that really looks like in neighborhoods, communities, at the national level, at the international level. Uh, and it resulted in hundreds of thousands of artwork that we receive from around the world and continue to receive from so many individuals that really portray the contributions of women and the sacrifices of women to their societies. And we're very excited to be co-hosting uh, Geneva in New York, an event, as Bonnie said, during the Commission on Status of Women, which will look at this concept of diversity and gender equality in the context of the Our Story is One campaign. And I think this theme of gender equality is so important So in 2005, I was chairing the NGO Committee on the Status of Women in New York. And a lot of women that had come, and we have thousands of women, like eight, 9,000 women from around the world that come to the UN. And a lot of them were bemoaning the fact that there, there's a lack of coherence in the gender equality architecture of the UN. So there were so many silos. There was UNIFEM, which was the United Nations Fund for Women. There was the Secretariat's Division for the Advancement of Women. There was INSTRA, which was a research and um, um, a training institute for women. And then there was the Office of the Assistant Secretary General and Special Advisor to the, to the Secretary General. And none of them were really talking to each other, and then UNDP does women's programs, UNFPA, the United Nations Population Fund, has programs on women, and somehow nothing was really getting done because there were these competing in interests. And so we decided to write a letter to the UN Secretary General and ask him, because he had set up a coherence panel, a system-wide coherence panel, and this was made up of past heads of government. Grassa Michel was on it, and the former president of Brazil was on it, the prime minister of Pakistan was on it. There were all these high-level dignitaries on this coherence panel. And the Secretary General, Kofi Annan, met with us, and he said, so what do you want? We said, we want the issue of the gender equality architecture to be put on the agenda of the coherence panel. And there was this big meeting in Geneva, and a few of us, about eight of us, were invited to that. And we met with these former heads of state, etc., who were on the coherence panel to talk to them about this issue. And they decided to take it on. In 2010, we were able to get what we had called the Gender Equality Architecture Reform Campaign, or the GEAR campaign, in short, which we co-chaired along with the Women's Environment Development Organization and the Rutgers University's Center for Women's Global Leadership, we actually had the creation of UN Women, one of the UN agencies. It's a hybrid agency. It was headed by Michelle Bachelet, the former president of Chile, was the first head of UN Women. And it was a really thrilling moment because we mm. actually saw some of the efforts take fruition mm. and the Baha'i international community was part of this effort alongside others and we were able to realize this wonderful. It's so fascinating hearing your uh, really individual also contribution to this to this architecture and and the BIC's contribution to the establishment of UN women essentially and you know I was just thinking about like 
one of the first and most significant contributions of the Baha'i community to, to the discourses of society, which still is a model for us, is actually the peace message uh, of the Universal House of Justice in 1985. And this, you know, at, uh, at the time, the, this, this message really analyzed the challenges facing humanity, which actually reading it now so many years later, it's, it seems like we're still grappling with the same challenges. And of course, one of the, the, the biggest challenges that it tries to address is, is securities, this issue of disarmament that maybe at the time was one of the biggest challenges that humanity was facing. And then it also talks about the barriers to peace the prerequisites for peace in really beautiful language. And it identifies some of the barriers to peace, for example, racism, the lack of equality between men and women, religious strife, the disparity between the rich and the poor, education. And it really addresses various different issues that humanity faces. And, and in bold language, it, it, it says that the resolution can only come through the principle of the oneness of humankind, mm -hmm. through humanity, international institutions, every individual recognizing that the solution lies in the oneness of humankind. And what I find really fascinating about this statement is that it is to the peoples of the world. Mm -hmm. In 1985, it's to, it's to the pe peoples of the world. So it's, it's a message that can be applied to so many different situations that all individuals can relate to all around the world. And, and it still guides our work today. It's a model of Baha'i contribution at the level of thought to the discourses of society. Absolutely. I mean, one of the beautiful um, parts in this message is how it challenges the assumption, the long-held assumption, that humans are fundamentally violent mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. humans are not peace-oriented. And I think very soon after, the Baha'i community embarked on a worldwide campaign where it started to explore educational programs in a systematic way to learn how these you know, insights, knowledge, uh, concepts, as well as principles that can build unified societies can be actually nurtured. Uh, it's actually applied in children classes and the youth programs that uh, we spoke about earlier, and also it creates spaces, learning circles for adults to explore mm. what are the principles, concepts, and skills needed to build cohesive societies and to build vibrant, unified communities. And the experience that, and the insights that have been gathered through trying to apply these programs in every corner of the world has been really you know, helpful to the entire Baha'i community. And it's something that you know, we're trying to disseminate as much as possible yes. and share these experiences in every spaces that we, we go to. Yes. So maybe you all remember this moving and historical photo that we have where uh, Ruhi Khanum is on behalf of the Baha'i community presenting the peace message to the UN Secretary General of the time. I find this photo, I can just look at it <laughs> for so long to, yeah, just this significant moment in history. And, and of course, as, as Hatim and others were saying, the, this conception of peace that's elaborated in the peace message is beyond just a lack of conflict or a lack of violence. It goes actually into really building peaceful societies around the world. And one aspect of this is partnership between regions and countries and institutions. And one such partnership is the African Union with European Union offices that we have. So I wanted to see if you guys can elaborate a bit on the work that you have been doing together. Yeah, actually, before before coming, that you you reminded me of this work on peace. So in the African context, you know, it's not only the advancement of the equality of women and men, but we have realized that in every peace process, women really sh not only should come, should take the front position in mm -hmm. conflict resolution, in negotiation. Yes. So the African Union itself now has realized it has established a FEMWISE, you know, as a desk where it brought wise women of the continent so that they can, because even in, in negotiations where women are involved, you know, <clears throat> it's likely the peace to get, you know, more and more strong, stronger. So, yeah, we are working on that also. Our office has even produced a video to elaborate what mm -hmm. women by women in peace or mm -hmm. why women should take a leadership role. Mm -hmm. Because ultimately every, every mother, you know, 
doesn't want to send her, her kid or her child to, to war. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so we're working on that. While also, we, what we realized also in the African context is that whatever we do, or whatever even the African Union does, is strongly related tied to the European continent. And it's because it is also the closest continent in terms of uh, land mass, uh, but also it's affected, it's so much related with uh, import, export, uh, trade, migration. And beyond that also, there is this colonial history, you know, almost the whole Africa uh, basically was divided among the, the European colonial, states. European yeah. colonialists. And even after, uh, you know, this, in fact, the original establishment of the Organization of African Unity was to help countries decolonize, you know, to facilitate the decolonization process. But then that's, the legacy has continued. So that relationship, whether, you know, sometimes you know, direct and direct relationship and support in terms of aid, in terms of uh, being involved in, in, in education, health, has continued. So we realized that now, okay, we, the two offices, Addis Ababa and Brussels office, should come together, sit together and explore mm -hmm. areas, uh, common areas, where now both European Union and African Union are involved, and uh, kind of draw insights from the, the activity, whether from the promise of world peace or other documents or other writings that we can share in both in the, in the African uh, European partnership. So we have done some some works. Probably Rachel can elaborate on that. Some of the works that we actually did. I was also thinking that this concept of the oneness of humanity. Mm -hmm. One of the big questions that I think all of our office are asking themselves is, what does it mean? for humanity to organize itself mm -hmm. at the global level. And it's very interesting, I think, with um, specifically the, 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 I think the last several crises that humanity has seen in, in the past couple of years, whether it's a sort of COVID or war related, we also see how um, incredibly interconnected humanity is. And that it's very difficult to see the well-being of one part of the world in isolation of that of another. And we're seeing this now. Yeah. We're seeing that the well-being of Europe is intimately dependent on that of other places in the world. And in this case, of Africa also. Both continents need each other. Both continents need to learn from each other. We see how there is wealth of experience and tradition in one continent, just as there is in the other. And we're trying to figure out what does this learning process between two continents, what can it look like? And of course, there's several things that sort of need to take place. One is you refer to it, that of the world order that we're operating in has been designed at a time when the supremacy of one part over the other was considered fact. So humanity has done a lot to address this. But of course, something that's been designed a while ago needs to be fundamentally revisited mm -hmm. so that these assumptions that sort of underpinned that design can be dismantled. And I think that is one aspect of the work that needs to be happening. How can both continents see each other as filled with capacity and knowledge? And how can they draw on each other's knowledge? You know, Baha'u'llah states that the well-being of mankind, its peace and security, cannot be accomplished until and unless its unity is firmly established. And one of the challenges that all of humanity is facing right now that necessitates unity is the challenge for climate change. Mm -hmm. And we see that with the successive conference of parties that we have been witnessing, and I've had the pleasure of participating in COP27 and COP28, both of them were held in the Arab countries, we've seen how much, how many attempts are there 
for all member states, for all you know, uh, intergovernmental organizations to work together to establish unity in order to address this massive challenge that humanity is facing right now. And I think what we are witnessing here is that the spirit of the age necessitates unity. And we are searching and trying to figure out how can we develop the skills to work together? How can we have this common insight of our common humanity and recognize that the well-being of one cannot be realized without the well-being of the whole? And this kind of interdependence is uh, what the UN is seeing for all parts of uh, the world. And Antonio Guterres, the UN Secretary General, put out our common agenda. Mm. And this <coughs> document is meant to really help all the member states and all peoples of the world to understand the interdependence. And out of it also came the new agenda for peace and the call for a summit for the future. And this summit is going to take place this year in September. Mm. And our office has been very involved with the coalition for the UN we need. My colleague Daniel Perel and the former ambassador of Ecuador, Maria Fernanda Espinosa, who was also president of the General Assembly a few years ago. They co-chair this coalition for the UN we need. And we've been hosting a series of conversations in our office called Road to the Summit. And the idea is to bring member states, UN officials, civil society, all together at the same table to talk about what the future might look like. Because the summit for the future somehow, oftentimes governments have short-term agendas till the next election, or civil society does till their funding runs out on a particular project. Very few people are really thinking ahead 75 years, 100 years ahead to what is the future we want to craft. And we talked about youth. It's the aspirations of all these young people that we need to be thinking about. It's the future of a world that will be peaceful and this understanding of the oneness of humankind that we believe that this summit for the future needs to have in mind when they make any decisions as to what kind of a world we want. We were talking about the peace statement and the peace statement states very clearly that the choice is ours. Mm. We can continue with these unimaginable horrors of war and conflict, or we can just by an act of consultative will sit down together and decide we want peace because we know how you can achieve peace. That we, we need that political will and we need for humanity to stand up and say we want peace now. You've been listening to In Conversation, a podcast series from the Baha'i World News Service. For more podcasts and stories, visit news.baha'i.org.